morning. Welcome to Lions Mere Church. I'm Pastor Tim Tronger. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Here at Lions Mere Church, we believe we are called to be God's healing and hope-filled congregation, make followers of Jesus Christ for the positive transformation of our community through lives of prayer, love, forgiveness, honesty, acceptance, and trust. It's wonderful to see you on this brisk November morning, and it's also, how many, how many besides me, um, woke up at their normal time, not remembering to set back their clocks yesterday, and so we got an extra hour of Sunday morning this morning. Yeah, it was wonderful, wasn't it? It's nothing more I'd rather do than have an extra hour before church to not sleep. If you're a guest with us this morning, I'd invite you to stop by the Welcome Center out in the entryway, pick up this book, just a free gift from us to you to say thank you for checking us out this morning. Also fill out this uh, welcome card, you'll find it in the seat back in front of you, let us know that you're here. If you have a prayer request that you would like lifted by the prayer ministry of the church, please fill out the back side of that card, put it in the offering later on during the service so that we can be in prayer for you over this week. Let me get this going here, there we go. Well, we are in a teaching series right now. I know we kind of took a break last week. We took a break last week with, with Pastor Reverend Scott Otis coming in. It was amazing. Just a big thank you to Scott for, for stepping in last week while I was out of town. But we're going to jump back into the book of Hebrews today. And we're going to be looking at a very specific attribute of Christ. And we've been looking at Jesus as the high priest. We've been looking at um, sacrifice and, and what that means to us today. But one of the things that, that uh, we don't always talk about today in our culture, something that really gets people kind of, uh, how do I say, grossed out, is the, the concept of Christ's blood. Right? And, and granted, it is the weekend after Halloween, so maybe this is the appropriate time to have this conversation. It actually just kind of how it all laid out for us. But today we're going to be talking about Christ's sacrifice and Christ's Blood. And as we, we talk about Jesus as high priest and the role that Jesus plays in our theology, our Christology, it's really important that we understand this, this concept of Jesus' blood. And, and, it, and it becomes a pivotal part of our understanding of Old Covenant to New Covenant with Christ. And even though we get grossed out, you know, I'm washed in the blood, you know, um, and, and all of those old hymns. There's a reason why for, for centuries we have sung about the blood of Christ and how important it is, even though today in our culture it doesn't hit us quite the same. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna run through that today. Uh, we're going to talk about Christ's blood and the high priest of Christ. And um, as we do, my, my hope is that as we talk through ritualistic sacrifice, that we come out of the debate with a better understanding not only of Christ's blood and what it means to us and why we still sing about it, but how it impacts our lives personally and our relationship with Christ. Because, as I said, this, this series has a lot of theology in it. And the theology of substitution and Christ's blood goes all the way back to Genesis. And it's deeply rooted in who we are as Christians today. And so we'll get to it in just a minute. Before we do that, let's take a moment to pray together. Holy God, uh, we come together this day with, with so many things on our hearts and minds. Well, people in our lives are hurting, family and friends have gone astray, and even pain and suffering in our own lives, Lord. You know, we, we know, God, that you love us and that you care for us and are constantly working in our lives, whether we recognize it or not. So Lord, I ask that you would use this time as we center our hearts on you, use this experience. Let your Holy Spirit come into this place so that we can draw closer to you and grow in our understanding of you and connect with you on a deeper level. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray together for a moment, shall we? Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the, the meditations, all of our thoughts, Lord, they would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're pulling into Hebrews again, into another chapter. 
um, into chapter nine, actually. And so to start today, you know, we've, we've kind of already done this, you know, talked about the temple, talked about priests, talked about all this. So I just want to kind of dive in this morning because where we're going to go today is, is a little bit, well, it's gory. We're going to talk about blood, and we're going to talk about being washed in the blood, and we're going to be talking about all of that. Uh, but to get there, we're going to we're going to pick apart uh, just like four or five verses today in, in Hebrews. And so, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to, to join me. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter nine, um, and we're going to be in verse eleven. Hebrews chapter nine, verse eleven, which says, "So Christ has now become the high priest over all good things." That have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and cows, he entered the most holy place once, once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousness from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. <clears throat> For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's as far as we're going to go today in the text, but we'll stay here for a few minutes. So before we before we dig too far into this passage, I want to look at kind of the purpose of what's going on here. What Paul is trying to tell us about Jesus' sacrifice, and and he gets to the the why, the why to the whole thing at, at the end of that little section where he goes to verse thirteen and fourteen, where he says, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousness from sinful deeds. So the old system, the old system of, of, of the temple um, what was there and in place with a specific purpose. The reason why they had sacrifices was so that you could become ceremonially clean. So that you could stand before God and worship him. Because if you were not ceremonial, ceremonial clean, ceremonially clean, I need more coffee, <clears throat> ceremonially clean, you couldn't go into the temple. You couldn't talk to God because there were these things that were between you that made you unclean. And that's the foundation of everything that we're going to talk about today. How do you get yourself right before God in order to stand before God? <clears throat> I need coffee. <clears throat> I think my voice is a little bit better this morning. So how do we get ourselves right with God before we can approach God in our lives? That's the purpose and the foundation of this Old Testament system. So Paul starts talking about the, the tabernacle, right? He says Jesus is, is the high priest and, and he's the most and he's gone to the most perfect tabernacle in verse 11 and he says that Jesus enters this place and Paul is leading us into this discussion that we've already had multiple times right in a series about what the temple is why the temple is necessary and how the people are going to live without the temple because remember 70 AD the temple's gone it's been destroyed and what do you do when the core of your spiritual being is no longer there when the ritual is gone. But Paul is not actually talking about the temple here. He's talking about the tabernacle. The tabernacle is something different. Everybody remember in the Old Testament that there's a temple and there's the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the tent that, that Moses was instructed to construct during the Exodus. He was, you know, he's out, build the tabernacle, build this tent of meeting, build this place uh, with these instructions, with this purpose, so that it could be used in this way, I like to think of the tabernacle as like the ultimate spiritual mobile home, right? Or RV, if we think about it that way, right? That there is this movable structure that's going with the people as they travel through the wilderness, as they're going to the promised land, this place that is designed and created for God to dwell in on earth. I, I mean, 
just images of Cousin Eddie with black rock bears and all of it, like just go through my mind this time of year when I think about the tabernacle moving across the wilderness with the people of God. And it would be generations after that, generations would pass um, before they actually got a temple and not a tabernacle. And as we remember from Old Testament stories is that there's this guy named David, right, who's going to build the temple, but then he doesn't. And then his son, Solomon, ends up building the temple. And that would be generations after generations later before there would be this permanent temple that would take the place of the tabernacle. So why does Paul talk about Jesus entering the tabernacle and not the temple? Well, obviously because the temple is been destroyed, right? 70 AD, the temple's gone, and so it's no longer there. So the first reason Paul is talking about the tabernacle is because the temple's gone. We already went over that. The second reason, and more important reason, that Paul is talking about the temple, or the tabernacle, instead of the temple, is a little bit deeper. You kind of have to understand this whole story that's come, coming to fruition here. Why is the temple important? Why is the tabernacle important? Important. So let's talk about the temple. Let's talk about the tabernacle and the high priests for a few minutes. I know we've talked about it before, but it's the fundamental backdrop of this old covenant, new covenant that we're going to kind of bridge into today. And it's the reason why we study the Old Testament. Why people say, I don't need the Old Testament. Just give me Jesus. Well, I get that. Yes, but you can't fully understand Jesus without understanding the Old Testament and Moses and the tabernacle because Jesus came to fulfill everything from that Old Testament story and how it's all connected and that my friends is the theology we're going to dig into today so let's talk Old Testament Leviticus uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers right if I say those books you all kind of think those are the books I don't read right yeah, right? This, these are the books we don't like to read. These, this is the Old Testament law, right? In the books of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, there are 613 laws that God gives. Now, I understand we've talked about this. I think we talked about it a couple of years ago when we talked about the law, Jesus' fulfilling law, and how, you know, it's kind of you have the Ten Commandments, which is really like 12 commandments. Um, and then there are all these other laws that kind of surround those commandments. Um, and some people, some scholars say that those are the priestly laws, like people wrote those to help us not break the official laws of God. All that, just throw all that aside for our argument today and our discussion today. We're just going to say those 613 laws are God's laws. We don't even, don't even worry about the rest of it today. Those 613 laws in Jewish tradition are called the mitz, uh, I'm gonna say it wrong, mitzvot, the mitzvot, M-I-T-Z-V-O-T, mitzvot. Now, not all of those laws are still followed today by Jewish practice because customs have changed, but those 613 laws kind of build the foundation for Jewish tradition, everything the Jewish people do. And the purpose of those laws that we, that we sometimes miss, that there is an inherent divine purpose why there are 613 laws. It has nothing to do with the number, but it has everything to, what they're suppo everything to do with what they're supposed to do. Those laws and those rules in the Old Testament were designed specifically by God, given to people, to do a very specific thing, and that is to teach people and help people live in relationship with God without sin and in relationship with each other without sin. The purpose of the law that God gave was to give people a foundation. You want to know how to live a godly life. You want to know how to live in community, the community of God. Here's how you do it. Here's the rule book. Okay, that was the purpose. All right, and, and in those 613 laws, there are, there are things that you're supposed to do, things you're not supposed to do. There are daily practices that you're supposed to do. There are rituals. There are ways of eating. There are ways of cleaning yourself. There are ways of dealing with your neighbor, right? This is that whole, your neighbor does this, and they owe you that, and then, you know, this back and forth, teaching people how to live together in God's harmony. 
All of those laws were designed specifically to help people grow in relationship with God and with each other. But none of that would be necessary. None of those laws would be necessary if our relationship with God wasn't broken. If our connection with God wasn't degraded, if something had distorted it over time, we wouldn't need any of those laws, any of those rituals, any of those rules. You see, Scripture tells us this, this story of the breakdown of humankind, right? We all know it. We, we love to talk about it. Humans' relationship with God gets broken down and destroyed and distorted in Genesis. The fall of humankind. It's our favorite story, isn't it? But what is most important is not the fall of humankind in my mind. And for a lot of scholars, it's not about the fall that is important. What is important is how we were originally created. That's one of the most important stories in Genesis. It's not that humankind fell. It's the way that humankind was originally created. You see, this whole concept of original sin in Genesis, you know, it, it, it's hard for a lot of people to think about. How can I be a sinner because someone else was a sinner? How can, how can one person's mistake impact all of humanity? And, and there's, there's, we could pre I could preach on this all day, but that's not what I want to get to. I just want you to understand that this becomes a stumbling point for a lot of people and what has always helped me when trying to reconcile original sin is going back to something else. And that's not original sin. That is what scholars call original righteousness. So Wesley talked about this a lot. Don't focus on original sin, focus on original righteousness. Not, not focusing on the fall of Adam and Eve, but focusing how, on um, how things were before sin enters the world. Instead of focusing on that original sin, we focus on the broken relationship with God. We should be focusing on what, what scholars call the Imago Dei. Have, have we ever talked about the Imago Dei? We probably do a whole series on the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei is Latin for the image of God. Imago, image, Dei, God, image of God. Our original righteousness. Before, because before sin enters the world, before, however you conceptualize sin, humankind lived in relationship with God without sin. There was a period of time, and yes, Genesis gives us days, but, but there was a period of time where humankind existed with God without any barrier, without any sin, without anything preventing us from experiencing God. And in Genesis, it, it captures this in, in Genesis 1.27. This is the Imago Dei verse where, where God creates humankind and he said, so God created human beings in his own image and the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them, right? This, you know this one, we all know this verse. This text is the foundation. These beings have been created in the image of God. And as such, we are created without sin. Because God is without sin. The image of God, of who God is, dwells within us. Until one point in history, one point in evolutionary history, where existed, we existed in original righteousness. Humankind lived. And, and Genesis talks about how Adam walked with God in the garden. Right? Whether, whether you believe Adam is a specific person or Adam is the, is the image of humankind before sin. It doesn't matter. Either way, at one point in time, human beings existed without sin, without that burden directly connected with God. But because humankind was gifted, and I say gifted intentionally, gifted with free will, Humankind had a choice to remain in that state or to go their own way. Enter the fall of mankind, humankind, original sin, however you want to call it. But what's more important than original sin is the fact that there was a time where things were actually perfect between us and God. There was no barrier between us and God. 
So that helps me focus on, on it a little bit better. Because if I focus on the fact that sin has entered the world and, and then we're all doomed, right? It doesn't give any hope. But if we recognize that, that Scripture is telling us that before sin was perfection, that we existed with God in perfection as, as human beings, and that that's what we're trying to get back to, then we understand the entirety of this book, the entirety of this book, from Genesis to John's Revelation, is God's work trying to restore what originally was created. How to reconcile people back to him. See, it's not about, it's not about original sin. God's purpose in the history of humankind is trying to get us back to where we once were, in relationship again with nothing between us. And that's where sacrificial theology and covenantal language and ritualistic sacrifice comes into play. Whew, that was a big segue, right? That's kind of a leap, but it's not. Because the fact is, is once something is broken, it can't be fixed. Now, I'm not talking about your car. I'm talking about relationships. When a relationship is broken, when we say something that hurts someone that we love or that we hate, we can never unsay what we said. We can never undo what we did, right? We can say we're sorry. We could be sorry. But that actions have consequences. And our lives are filled with us living out those consequences and trying to rebuild from those debts that are owed. When you hurt somebody, a debt has been owed to them that may or may not be able to be repaid. Even if we say we're sorry, doesn't matter how much you want something to go back to the way it was, things will never be the same again. That's the same for our choices that we make in life, and that's also the same for the sin that enters our lives. And just like we want to restore the relationships of the people around us that we hurt, and we have distorted relationships in our lives with, God also wants to restore those relationships with us. That is what this whole book is about. How does God work at restoring that which has been broken, that which has separated us, that which has, that which has disconnected us from God? So God gives the covenant to Abraham, right, in Genesis. And it goes okay for a while, but then it doesn't for a while. And so God saves the people of Israel his people, right? The covenant, I will be your God, you will be my people. And then they get enslaved in, in Egypt. And so God sends Moses and he sets the people free. And then he said, okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to live with you now. And we're going to build the tabernacle. And we're going to have these rules, this law, and we're going to be able to help get you back in relationship with God again. And part of those rules that, that God gives the people with Moses is the sacrificial rules and regulations to absolve people of sins. Now, I'm not talking about like Catholic priests saying, I forgive your sins, or when we do a, a prayer of confession together and I say, I, I forgive you of your sins. I'm talking about like, like the, the, the tradition of cleansing a person from physical sin, what it costs to do that. Um, I explained sin a few a few months ago, how I perceive it, how it's like anything that we put between God and us, that God is constantly like showering his grace and mercy out to us. And and we um, choose to put things between God and us. So uh, another illustration, like, like a flashlight. God's love is like a flashlight pointing at you, okay? And um, you can put your hands up in the way. It doesn't change how much light is shining at you, but it changes how much light you receive. That makes sense? That's kind of what sin is. The things that we put between God and us. That God's love for us doesn't change. But what we do changes how we interact with God's love. Going back to these, these laws 
understanding that there is a something between God and us, going back to the mitzvah, or, or even simply the Ten Commandments, God gives instructions to his people about how to live their lives, how to eliminate sin. So here's what you do. This is how you live together so you live a holy life. But people still sin. Like, if I told you, do this, and you will be a perfect Christian. Like, that's what he's saying. Do these things, and you'll have it all figured out. But people didn't do those things, and they still sin. And so he said, okay, so you still have sin. So we have to get rid of that so you can have a relationship with me. So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do blood sacrifices. Why God chose blood sacrifices? I, I could tell you, but I, I think we'll get there in a minute. God gives the sacrificial mandates. Understand that from the beginning, from the very beginning of Jewish tradition, blood sacrifice of the innocent is a common practice. It is a key part, too, of sacrificial theology. It is pivotal to understanding Jesus on the cross for us. I know we don't like the idea of the concept of, of, of the sacrifices in our day and age. It doesn't, it doesn't jive well with our understanding of, of how we exist in the world. Uh, it seems brutal. It seems barbaric. It seems antiquated. It's like, why would they do that? This is gross and disgusting, killing animals and throwing their blood at people. And you know, like I've seen Vikings and these other shows where they, they butcher all these animals and throw blood around. Like, why? It's so gross. But well, we have to understand it in the context of the time. When we do, it's not barbaric, and it's not brutal at all. It's actually very deeply meaningful. And so to start to understand the process of why the blood sacrifice was so important, we need to first remember that distortion of the Imago Dei, that there's a sin, there's something between us and God that, 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 is, that is not right, that causes us to not be able to stand fully before God. We've become distorted, like a, like a mirror that's fogged. Okay? Theologically speaking, uh, when, when we're talking about these sacrifices, when Paul says the old sacrifices of goats and bulls and ashes of peppers, the, the goat and the bull would be sacrificed at the tabernacle or the temple. And the high priest would take the blood from the sacrificed animal and they would take it into the tabernacle or into the temple and they would sprinkle it on the chair that was in there and then later on they would take other blood into the holy of holies and sprinkle it in there as well and when they did that the blood sacrifice was given to god and would take the place of the person who owed a debt to god the debt that was owed by that person who had, who had sinned against God, or sinned against people, and which was against God as well. There was, there was a debt that had to be paid. And instead of sacrificing yourself, because why would we do that? God gave this option to say, okay, take this animal as a substitute for you and give it to God. Substitute your blood payment to God with this animals. And substitute, that's substitution theology. That something else takes our place. And it's, it's without having owed someone something. Like I think about the, the, this way, I barter with a lot of my friends. Right? Like, they do something for me, I owe them money, and instead of giving them money, I give them something else. Oh, would you take this and trade? That's kind of like what this is. We owe God something, and God's like, you know what? I'll take that instead. We'll call it square. That's, that's what the, the sacrificial substitutionary theology is all about. People owe this debt that they can't pay back themselves, and God says, okay, I'll do a ritualistic uh, sacrifice. You know, this whole eye for an eye and ear for an ear process of substitution for sin. And there was no better sacrifice in this time. No better sacrifice than a perfect cow or a perfect goat. 
You say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I can think of a whole lot of better things. I know that when my kids are at school, instead of selling cookies, we'd rather just pay them off. Can't you just pay off God? Can I just buy something and, and give it to the church? That'd be way simpler than actually doing anything. But you have to remember that this is an agricultural society. Thousands of years ago, everything was driven by agriculture. Ask the cattle rancher. When I was out in Southwest Kansas, I, I had a friend, cattle rancher, at least let me hunt on his property, and he was so focused on his herd. I don't know if anybody knows cattle ranchers or not in, in their life, but he's so focused on their herd. Every heifer, every bull, every calf has value. And, and they're important. But if you ask a cattle rancher and say, I want you to give me your best heifer, the one that's unblemished, the one that's a perfect size, that's breeding stature, that's young, that's in its prime, and I want you to take it over there and I want you to kill it, burn it, don't eat the meat, and throw the blood on the ground. Like, it sounds gross, but that would horrify a rancher. Because that cow is everything to that rancher. That's his future, right? That, that, that is how important it would be. But to say, I want you to give away that one cow that you have, that is the best of the best that you have, to cleanse you for sin. So you're no longer a sinner in God's eyes. This ritualistic animal sacrifice in an agricultural society has very deep meaning for those who understood it and participated in it. Because those animals were their livelihood. And the response we often give, you know, of the nasty, bloody, barbaric rituals, how could they do that? It wasn't, it wasn't how it was received in their culture. That, that gut feeling that they would have for a sacrifice would be like, if, if I talk to you today about everyone's favorite conversation in church, money. If I were to tell to you that for you to be forgiven, you have to empty your 401k and burn it and throw the ashes out on the, on the field. Does that make your gut go a little bit? Mm. That's the feeling. It should make you feel uncomfortable what God is asking the Israelites to do. The driving force in our economy and capitalistic society is all about money, 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 money. Make, making money that makes you money. So if we were to take that concept that way, I'm not telling you to do that at all. Don't rewind this video online and say, Tim said, burn your 401k. That's not what I said. I'm saying that's what it would be like. Your livelihood. Giving up your livelihood so that you can have a relationship with God again. In one way, we say that and we say, you know what? Some of us would probably say, I would give anything to have my life right with God again. Some of us would probably say, I would give anything but that to have my life right with God. That gross feeling is what the Israelites would have felt. Not the blood, but the legitimate sacrifice that it would have taken. So let's, let's look real quick. I want to go back and, and just share the process in this. In Leviticus, 19, or Leviticus, Leviticus 16, 3, it says, just talking about bulls and heifers and, and, and the ashes that Paul talks about. It says, when Aaron enters a sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. He must bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So he, well, he's got to bring these into the tabernacle, right? Flip forward a little bit about uh, starting 14. Then he must take some of the blood of the bull, dip his finger in it, and sprinkle it on the east side of the atonement cover. He must sprinkle blood seven times with his finger in front of the atonement cover. Then Aaron must slaughter the first goat as a sin offering for the people and carry its blood behind the inner curtain. It's the Holy of Holies. And there he will sprinkle the goat's blood over the atonement cover and in front of it, just as he did with the bull's blood. And through this process, here's where it's important. And through this process, he will purify the most holy place and he will do the same for the entire tabernacle 
because of the defiling sin and rebellion of the Israelites, purifying the temple so that God has a place to be. Paul also talks about the ash, and so if we go to Numbers 19, we, we find a little bit more about what the ash was all about. When they burned the animals and they took the ash, and in Numbers 19, 9, it says, Then someone who is ceremonially, ceremonially clean will gather up the ashes from the heifer and deposit them in a purified place outside the camp. They will be kept there for the community of Israel to use in the water for the purification ceremony. This ceremony is performed for the removal of sin. So part of this is about purifying the temple. The other part of this is about purifying the people, the forgiveness of sins, the absolution of sins, that by doing these things, giving this sacrifice, my sin is now gone. I can now stand with God one-on-one. -on -one. That's the purpose of this bloody mess that is this sacrificial process. And the whole point, the whole point of this is just to purify and remove sins from God's people so that they could connect with God with no barrier, nothing in between. That's it. It's that simple. Substitute this instead of me. These sacrifices in these texts are specific to the, the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, um, a Jewish festival that happens every year. And this annual festival in the Jewish tradition, every year the priest would do this sacrifice to, to purify the entire community. This is when we talked a few weeks about, ago about the scapegoat. This is also where they did the scapegoat, where they had the one goat that was butchered and the other goat that was sent out into the wild to, with all of the sins of the community so that everyone could be free of sin. And, and this ritualistic sacrifice at the temple would happen yearly. You had to keep doing it. Even though people had the code, people had the law, People knew what God had said, they were, how they were supposed to live. This is how you should live. People still kept sinning because of free will, because of choice. They kept sinning. And they kept falling away from God. Free will is a gift so that we're not all robots. But it comes with consequences. See, ideally, what, what would have happened in an ideal world God gives us the law. God gives us the, the ritualistic sacrifice. God gives us the way that we're supposed to live. And we start to live that way. And then we use that sacrifice as we need to, to be purified again. But eventually, if everyone does what we're supposed to do, then you no longer need the sacrifice because everyone is holy and living a holy life. That's the way it was supposed to happen. But that's not what happened, is it? The, the, the sacrifices became more like a, a cheap grace. Oh, I just keep doing whatever I want, and I'll sacrifice a bull, and then I'll be purified again, and I can talk to God. And, and it didn't work. What God had instilled for people didn't work. And so, God went to the next level. He kept trying. Prophets. And, and all of the prophets, and, and all of the kings, and Finally, it still didn't work, and so he took the next step, and he sent his son Jesus to earth. To live among human beings, to be human, 100% human, without sin. The perfect heifer for a sacrifice. Unblemished, no sin, everything to God. And then Jesus himself willingly sacrifices himself on the cross. Unblemished, pure blood sacrifice. Just like the blood of the goat and the blood of the bull and the ashes of the heifer that are sprinkled on the interior of the tabernacle and are out in the community, Jesus dies and his blood pours out over all the world as a final and ultimate sacrifice for the sins of humankind throughout all time. And so just like the animal sacrifices, the, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus becomes the perfect sacrifice for all people. 
But unlike the bull, unlike the goat, unlike the heifer that cleaned people for a year or less, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, God himself in human form, leading and dying on the cross for forgiveness of sins of all humankind throughout all time, means that we no longer need the animal sacrifice. Because the ultimate sacrifice is already made. As Paul says in, in verse 13, he, he clarifies this. The old system of the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could clean people's bodies from ceremonially impurity for a while. How much more can Christ's blood do for us? This is why for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years, Christians have said things like, Jesus hung on the cross for me. This is why we've said for thousands of years, Jesus paid it all. Or, I am cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Or all of the old hymns that we sing, dating back 400 years or more, that make us cringe today because we don't like talking about being washed in the blood, point us to this divine reality of Christ's sacrifice, Christ's blood offering that redeems the world, that makes us right again, that takes our sin instead of us paying that price. That we don't have to kill our livestock anymore to pay for our sins. We don't have to give the best that we have to God in absolution for our sins because Jesus paid that debt that we couldn't pay. It's important for us as Christians to realize the importance of this sacrifice and understand the depth of this offering that Jesus makes. That God gave the best of himself so that we could be made right with him. It also changes how we talk about sacrifice, isn't it, too? Because if this is the case, if the debt has already been paid and there is nothing that we have to do to be made right with God except believe in Christ and accept him as our Savior, and this goes beyond our, our giving. This goes beyond giving our best to God because money and giving God our money and our time and our talents and our efforts is, has nothing to do with being right with God. I, I, I had this, we did, I was at a church years ago where we had our, our you know, stewardship campaign and everyone gave pledges and, and the common response was, hang on a second, I gotta go get my bill. All right, like, like giving was a, was a bill that, that he had to pay. Like that giving was just you know a part of, I gotta pay my part, this is what I do, yada yada, here you go. But understanding the sacrifice of Christ changes our understanding of what we give and why we give. I just want to hit that just for a minute because I want to make sure that we're absolutely clear. Issue with a church, with a pastor, or with church people who talk about giving their money, needing money, wanting money, paying money as if traditional upon how much you gave. And I'm sorry if that's you. That is not what it should be. You should never have been treated that way. Someone who did treat you that way didn't understand the truth of, of sacrifice, of Christ's sacrifice, and what it means to us today. Because while money is important, I know it makes us feel uneasy when we talk about it in church, but recognize that feeling would be the same thousands of years ago when the rancher was talking about giving rid of his hot heifer to the temple. If you would feel uncomfortable about giving in church, then you're feeling the right feeling. I just want to put that out there. If it makes you feel uncomfortable, good. Mission accomplished. Because giving as Christians is not obligation, it's a spiritual practice. Giving and generosity requires us to understand it's not sacrificial, like Christ's blood is a sacrifice substitution for us. We don't buy our salvation through giving in the church. We don't buy our seat in the church. We don't buy anything with what we give. But God still calls us to give. Give the things that are closest to our hearts. Not for salvation. 
but so that the entirety of our heart can be connected with God. So that we can align with God. Because if you don't know this, I'll tell you, God is generous. It may not feel that way sometimes, but God is generous, constantly pouring out mercy, grace, love to all of us. And if we are made in the image of God, if we hold within us the Imago Dei, then we too are generous if we're demonstrating God's character in ourselves. And we often offer money. Money is like the easiest thing to talk about in this because it's something that we hold so tightly. And we put our trust in everything, but we put our faith and our trust in money first. Our 401ks are going to get us through. And I'm guilty of this. I'll be honest. I check my 401k every week to find out how much money I have, how much money I need, and how it's going to set my life up for my future. I am as guilty as this as anyone else. So don't hear me say that I'm not. But money is not, the, like having that money is not the point. What God wants is for us to be generous and connected with him. And so giving up money is hard. That's why we give it up. But it's not just money. It's not just money that gives, that helps us become generous. It's, it's other things too. You know, one of my most valuable commodities, and I had this conversation with Jacob on the way here to church this morning, my most valuable thing that I have to offer is not my money. It is my time because I have no time. We were talking here this last weekend about even this weekend, I, uh, the things that there are things that I have to do, things that I want to do and things that I need to do. Yesterday, I wanted to go deer hunting. I needed to go to the range to sight in my guns. I had to write this sermon. I could only do two of the three things. I'll get out deer hunting one of these days. It'll happen. Time is something that is so precious to me that it is hard to sacrifice, to give. But if I am a generous person, then that is something that I need to give because if it's important to me, it's important to God. So like when we were doing the stage, we had two weeks to build the stage. I drove out here every day I could and gave my time and my finances to it because it's important to God. I think God is working in this community, and if it's important to God, it needs to be important to me. I wanted to go deer hunting. I even asked my folks, hey, do you mind if I don't come out on Saturday? I really want to hit the stand. And they said, you can do whatever you want, Tim. <laughs> and I said, I'll be there. Energy is also something that's really hard for me to give because just like I have limited time, I have limited energy. It's not just about money. It's about connecting with God and giving God, trusting God, that's the thing, trusting God with what is most important to us. And when scriptures tell us that God loves a cheerful giver, it's because, and I know this is kind of a segue, but it is because the sacrifice has already been made for us. We don't have to pay God back for the sins we've committed. We don't have to do anything to fix what we broke. Jesus paid it all. Jesus fixed it for us. He gave himself so that we could live in relationship with God again. Out of God's great mercy and love, we don't have to pay God to get out of jail free card, right? The debt has already been paid. Our sins, past, present, and future, have hung on that cross throughout time. Because of that, we have the opportunity to grow with God face-to-face, one-on-one, through, through giving, through spiritual practices, through prayer, through growth, through study of scripture, through relationship, through all of those things. Clear and holy and growing in those moments. I like how Peter says it. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 3. He says, Christ's suffering for our sins once and for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. He says, Christ suffered for all sins, for all time, to bring you safely home 
to God. For John says that like this in 1 John chapter 1, but if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. From all sin. We don't sacrifice animals anymore. We don't do that because Jesus took it all on his own. And all we have to do to receive that gift is to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to trust in him, to commit our lives to him. Because he is our high priest who paid the price for our lives lived with God. Let's pray together, shall we? Holy God, the depth of your love is so vast that you would love us so much to let your son die for us. For the sake of our sin, for our faults, for all of our failures. Lord God, I lift every single person up here today. All of those joining us online, and even all of those listening to the podcast, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would work in every one of our lives to heal us all from the inside out. For any and all people, Lord, that are here, that are listening, that are joining us, Lord, that, that are ready to commit their lives to you, to accept the sacrifice of your son on their behalf, I pray that each one of them would, would, would have the courage to say these words along with me. Lord, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe that he died for me so that I could live in you. I renounce my sin, and I lay it on the beams of the cross, where your Son, God, died for me. I commit my life to your will. I choose you to be my Lord, the Lord of my life. God, I ask that you would work in each one of us in the way that only you can to heal us, to grow in us until we are perfected in your love. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, that we pray. Everyone sing. Amen. Now, before you're dismissed, remember that we're not simply dismissed from this place, but we're sent out into the world. So go into the world with these words that God gave to Moses, that Moses gave to Aaron, that Aaron gave to his sons to give to the people of Israel. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in God's peace. Amen.